All right, open the, uh, to the book of Romans. And what we're going to do, we started a series uh, last week on the book of Romans. Uh, Pastor Allen kicked it off. And um, Romans, it, it, of course, you know, I mean, this is, uh, this is just my, uh, my opinion. I think Romans is probably one of the, uh, uh, it, probably the most important book in the entire New Testament. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote it. Uh, the reason that I say that it's important, uh, it's even called the uh, the Romans Road, and uh, it, it covers just about every aspect of uh, uh, sin, uh, a holy living, uh, repentance, uh, salvation, forgiveness. I mean, it just covers everything, and it's awesome. And it's what I wanted to do. I wanted to give you a little background on uh, the Book of Romans. Uh, the, I don't know why we call it the book of Romans. You guys know this, but it's an epistle. An epistle is a letter. And uh, it's a letter that Paul had written uh, into uh, the book of, or to the uh, church at Rome. And uh, Paul started a lot of the churches in the New Testament, but Paul, it's believed that Paul did not start the church at Rome uh, that Peter did. Uh, and that's kind of strange if that's true because nowhere in the book of Romans does Paul even mention Peter. Uh, and and uh, so what, what's significant about uh, Rome? Well, the church had already been started. Uh, Paul had not been to Rome and visited the church. And so this letter that he's writing is talking about how he wants to come and visit them. Uh, the, 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 the other unique thing about this is, uh, I made some notes here, uh, the Jews were expelled under uh, the leader Claudius. Uh, the Jews had been fighting among themselves. Uh, you know, some of them were still uh, uh, devout Jews under the law. Some had been converted uh, to Christianity and they still kept the law. Uh, and then Nero uh, came in and he took over and Nero allowed the Jews that were exiled to come back in and so they started growing again. And then if you study history, there was a great fire in Rome that uh, destroyed Rome. And uh, so after that is what they started doing is they started uh, uh, really coming down on the Christians and they started, uh, some of them they were crucified and they started killing them. Uh, and so there wasn't a lot of Jewish Christians there. And here's the unique thing is uh, there was a, did that go off camera or is it still on? Uh, and, and there was a lot of Gentiles there. And uh, usually there's, there's more Jews than there are Gentiles, but now there are Gentiles, which are the non-Jew Christians, which we're, we're considered. And uh, they, it was basically their church in Rome because they outnumbered the Jews at the time. Now, the Jews that were there uh, really looked down on the Gentiles. And the reason for it is those Jews uh, were still, they, 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 they had embraced Jesus as the Messiah but they were still living under the law. And so they were saying, there's certain meat you can't eat, there's certain meat you can't eat, uh, uh, there, you have to do these things for these celebrations and these festivals and all this. And uh, one of the big things was they said, you have to be circumcised. Now circumcision uh, shows uh, the cutting away of the foreskin and a separation. And uh, under the Old, New Testament, we don't have to do that. Uh, matter of fact, the Bible talks about circumcision of the heart. Okay, but the, the Jews there, the Christian Jews were telling the, telling the Gentiles, you need to be circumcised or you're not really a Christian. And the Gentiles were saying, that's under the old law. You don't have to do any of that stuff, man. And so they were bickering back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And uh, there was a lot of idol worship there. There was, uh, uh, you know, like I say, the Jews were still uh, observing the law almost to the T. And uh, why is it that you don't have to, in my opinion, the law was not done away with, but you don't have to obey the law. Uh, uh, it's, it's like uh, there's a law that says I cannot murder someone. That law doesn't apply to me. Why? Because I'm not going to murder anybody. If I murder someone, then that law applies to me. You see what I'm saying? A lot of people will tell you that, and this is my opinion, uh, that the, Jesus did away with the law. But I, I just don't believe that. Jesus said, don't think that I came to uh, do away with the law, but I came to fulfill the law. And uh, so, the, the, you know, they were living under the law, which, which meant, that it basically is what they were saying is, in order to go to heaven, yeah, you have to accept Jesus as your Savior, but you also have to live by the law, which means that salvation was by works, and it's not. Salvation is by grace, and that's what this whole book about. Now, uh, the way that Paul started the letter was, uh, Hi, how you doing? Uh, you know, I heard about you guys, your, your church there. I'm hearing that it is really awesome. And, uh, you know, I've been trying to come down there, and I've been trying to talk to you for a long time. And, uh, you know, I've been busy, man. I've been going all over Asia, and I've been starting churches here and there. And, uh, you know, but I tell you, I'm really looking forward to coming down. Maybe we can go to Starbucks and 
and have a little uh, Tai Chi latte and we'll just talk about some of the things there and I just want to bless you and all this kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden, bam, he hits him with a bombshell. He, Paul just takes off like you wouldn't believe, all right? And so let's look at uh, chapter 1, verse 13. And it says, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, Listen, I want to tell you something. There's a lot of ignorant Christians. Did you know that? I say that out of love. And you know what I mean by ignorant? Well, a couple of things. Number one is the church isn't preaching them the truth, and so they're ignorant. And number two, they're hearing the truth, and they refuse to do it. And that's about one of the dumbest, most ignorant things you can do because it could cost you your life spiritually, all right? Uh, now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you. See, he's saying I wanted to come, uh, but was let uh, but, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. And so he's focusing on the Gentiles more than anything because the, there's more Gentiles there than Jews, all right? And then he, verse 14, he says, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. And what he's saying is salvation is for everybody. Jesus is for everybody. There is no distinction, all right? 15, so as much uh, as in me is I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in, is in Rome also. Now, verse 16 is one of the most powerful statements other than salvation that uh, I think every single preacher ought to have this on a plaque or written somewhere in his Bible. And it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, why do you think Paul put that in there, that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? I got an idea because of what he's fixing to lay on them. I mean, he's fixing to hit them, and he's going to hit them with everything he's got. See, he's still in that little, you know, how you doing, man, everything's all nice and peachy keen and all this kind of stuff. Now, verse 18, this is where a lot of people have a problem. This is where, starting in verse 18, a lot of preachers will not preach this. And listen, I'm going to tell you something. We need to, to preach on the wrath of God. You know, I, I, I tell people, you know, God's going to do this. And they say, oh, God's a loving God. God would never do that. Why would you say that? Oh, man, don't do it. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. God is slow to anger. It doesn't say he won't anger. He is slow to anger. And I'm telling you something. You correct your kids. Why do you have such a problem when I tell you that God may correct you? All right? And there's times. Now, listen. And you don't, you don't, you're not going to like this, but I'm going to show you this morning. There's times when God says, because he knows your heart, and you, they're, they're, you, these are unique cases, but God says, I wash my hands of that. I'm, I'm away from that. You're on your own. And you say, God would never do that. I'm going to show you. We just don't want to hear that. We, 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 we want to think that we can do whatever we want to do and that we're under grace and God says, oh, that's okay. All right? Is that the attitude you have with your kids? Let me tell you something. You say, hey, you get in the bedroom. Why? I am fixing to tear you up. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah. I don't want to hear any excuses. You get in there. God will do that to us too. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now here's what I want you to get. Who is he talking about here? Because we're fixing to go into several verses where it talks about them, those, they. And I want you to know who he's talking about. And it says, of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. It's talking about someone. Remember we talked about he who hears these words of mine and doesn't do them. It's like the fool that builds his house on the sand. Everything that I'm fixing to read to you the rest of this morning out of uh, the book of Romans is going to be someone that has read this. They understand this. They know what this says. They know what God's requiring them to do. And they say, well, I'm just not going to do it. I'm just not going to do it. This is not, listen, I... If, if, if you've ever had me angry at you or to sit down and have to bring correction, you know I don't mess around. I get right to it, and, I, I just, and, and a lot of people take that the wrong way. But listen, I treat, I treat people differently. If we have a baby Christian and I, uh, you know, they mess up, we baby them along, and we say, it's okay, it's okay. But listen, when I get somebody in the church that I know, and they've been uh, uh, saved for 15, 20 years, they sat in under some of the best teaching, uh, you know, I'm talking about that I've known them out of all those years, and, and they know to do right, and, and they refuse to do right, that's when I set them down, and I say, hey, look at me in the eye. What's wrong with you? I can't do this because I'm a pastor, but I feel like, wake up, man. And I'm like, well, you know, why am I even in here having this conversation with you? You know better. Why are you doing this? 
I'm telling you, God is serious about this. Okay, verse 19, it says, Because that which may be known to God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. God's shown it to them. Now listen, a lot of people say, how could God send someone to hell? Uh, I think this is, let me make sure. Yeah, how could some God send someone to hell that, uh, uh, you know, maybe they were never witness to about God? Uh, you know, they didn't hear the gospel. Uh, now, now, the Bible says that the end won't come until the gospel is preached to every, every person. But what if there's one person uh, that never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, is it possible for them to go to hell? Well, it is. And I'll tell you why. Uh, well, let's go ahead and read it, and then I'll explain it to you. Look at verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are out without excuse. Now, let me tell you what that means to me. They may, there, there, there may, may be a, a, a tribe in Africa uh, that, that uh, you know, they're finding them a lot, that has, they have no communication, they're still living there, but maybe those Africans will say, you know, in their language, the sun comes up, the moon comes up. I, I mean, look at the plant. I, I mean, there's got to be something. There's got to be an excuse for this. There's got to be a reason for this. I think that for them, that is good enough for salvation. They may not know the name of Jesus. They may not know Yahweh. But they look and they say, this isn't a mistake. There has got to be a power. And based on this, not us, but someone that's never heard the gospel, when they say, Wow, somebody's got to be in control. I think that is good enough for their salvation. They're without excuse, all right? If you believe in the Big Bang Theory, you got a big problem. And I always tell people, if they say, well, I believe in evolution, I, I say, take a deck of cards, 52 cards, open that room, and just throw all those 52 cards in there and slam the door real quick, wait about 30 minutes, go back in there, and you think those cards are going to be stacked up perfectly, those 52 uh, cards in that playing deck? No, they're not. Well, that's what you're saying, how the world came about. But if you take someone in there and they meticulously put all of those together and makes everything perfect and everything, that's what God did. He put it all together perfectly. It didn't just, boom, happen. I, I, I can't wrap, you know, it's like the abortion. How can someone not see that that is murder? It blows me away. It, 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 they, they, they have got such a, you know, the Bible talks about scales on your eyes. They are so blinded. How can you say that that, it just blows me away. Oh, this isn't murder. It is. You're killing a baby. And I used to tell people, you know, I'm pro-life. I mean, I'm pro-choice. Because God made us choice. I think that the baby that you killed should have had a choice. You see what I'm saying? I can't tell people that unless I explain it to them, but pro-choice. You're not giving that baby a choice. You're saying, boom, you don't even have a chance. I, I mean, as bad as I hate suicide, if that person wanted to grow up and commit suicide, at least give them that choice. If that person grew up and said, I hate God and I want to go to hell, at least give them that choice. God gives, them, God gives you that choice. And it's just, it's just murder. It's just murder. Okay, verse 21. It says, because uh, that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. I'm fixing to hit you with another little thing here. Neither were they thankful, but uh, became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves, verse 22, to be wise. Now look at verse 23. They became fools. And changed the glory of God, the uncorruptible God, into an image made light to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Did you know that we should never make an image of God, a painting? Michelangelo had the painting of uh, God, the hand reaching down and reaching for man. But did you know that we, we, there, we should not have a statue of God? We should not have a picture of God? Uh, a, a matter of fact, uh, uh, you know, the Ten Commandments talks about that. Have no graven image. Why is that? Anybody know? How can you, how can you possibly make something out of stone or out of, out of uh, 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 wood? That, that's what this is talking about. How, how can you make anything, it says, and change the glory of the in, uh, uncorruptible God into an image made to corruptible man and to birds and forth? How? There is not, Michelangelo was one of the greatest artists in the world. He, he, he's like a little peon. 
How can he, how can he portray God in an image? He can't. And so God is saying, you know, don't even, don't even attempt to do it, okay? Verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up, who, who is them? That's why I wanted you to know. Who are we talking about? You go back to the beginning. It's people that heard the word, that knew the word, and they knew what to do, and they just absolutely refused to do it. And it says, to uncleanness through the lust. Now, here, here we go. Here's the bombshell. Now, you, can you imagine? Can you imagine never meeting Paul, and you got your church, and you think, man, we're just, we're just stroking along, man. Our church is doing good. And Paul says, oh, yeah, you think so? You think so? Let me hold a little bit of your sin up to you, all right? I'm telling you, and it ain't pretty. 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and served the creature more than cr the creator. Now, what does that mean? Loving the creature more than cr the creator. Well, I can tell you right off what it means. It means lust. It means if uh, 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 you're in here and, and uh, you know, uh, let's say Bonnie and I aren't married and, uh, you know, I'm talking to Jesse and I'm just a preaching away and I, I just keep looking down at her, you know, because we're not married and I think, man, she's a hot little old chick, man. You know, that's lust. And I'm looking at the creature instead of the creator. And I'm telling you, lust, and you say, oh, well, I never lust. Oh, you're, you're lying. Don't tell me you never lust. And, and listen, I'm going to tell you, there, there's two things wrong with that. Number one, men, uh, we ought to have blinders on and look at our wife and nobody else. And number two, women, you shouldn't give us a, a reason to lust by the way you dress. Listen, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. You shouldn't be wearing little short little things there. You shouldn't be wearing the low things there. You, you know, I'm, I'm telling you, it's wrong. You, and you guys know that. You guys know that. Now, I look across here and I don't see anybody that's violating that. Okay, you know, let's move on. But listen, I'm telling you, man, you know, you uh, 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 I tell you, sometimes you can go to church and it's like a meat market. Men, guys are just hanging all over women and all this kind of stuff, okay? Uh, and it says, uh, verse 25, who changed, now here, here it comes, this is, this is hard, and I'm going to, I've gotten, in the past three years, I've gotten a little bit of flack because of this, but you know what? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will not back up. I will not shut up. I will not give up. But I'm going to have to explain something to you. Let me get it out in the open. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creator, uh, creature more than the creator. Verse 26, for this cause God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into uh, that which is against nature. And likewise, also men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one towards another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error was great. Now, I'm going to uh, we'll stop right there because this is where I need to explain something to you. Now, Leviticus 18.22 says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It's an abomination. Listen, he's talking about homosexuality there. And, and every time I, 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 I preach the word, I, I, you guys know that I would, if, if someone told me, uh, this Sunday, hey, I'm going to be bringing a, my next door neighbor. Uh, they, they, they've never been to church. And I said, okay. And uh, they're gay. And so I'm not going to go home and say, man, I need to get a sermon up talking about how gay, you know, how homosexuality is a sin. So when that person, no, 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 I, I would never do that. Number one, that's the flesh, you know. But listen, I, I also, a lot of pastors will sit here and say, you know, we're doing this on Romans, uh, homosexuality, you know. I tell you, I, I just really need to skip over that part, you know, because I, I may just offend somebody. Listen, we got to preach the whole thing. Did you know that? And you say, are you homophobic? Do you hate uh, homosexuals? Of course not. Uh, Bonnie's got some homosexuals in her family. I've got some in my family. Some of you guys may have some friends or family uh, that are homosexuals. And, but listen, I'm going to tell you something. We love them, but you've got to preach the truth. And you've got uh, you, you, you to tell the truth, okay? Are we going to reject them? No. Your salvation is not my responsibility. I say that all the time. And, and as far as homosexuality, I put it out there. And then it's, it's between you and God what you do with it. And you say, well, uh, uh, you know, uh, would you, uh, would you uh, 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 marry a, a gay couple? Uh, no, I would not. It's against my, my religious convictions. Uh, let me ask you this. Let me uh, give you an illustration, all right? And, and here's why I'm saying this. Because we take something like homosexuality and we just zoom. We zero in on it. 
And God's saying, you know what? There's a whole lot of other sin out there too. Oh, yeah, but these are the ones we want to get. And, and listen, let me tell you something. I told you that I would never marry a gay couple. If uh, I, Jesse, I'm just going to use you as an example. If you, if you were single and if you came to me in private and you said, hey, uh, you know, I want to get married, will you do the ceremony? And uh, you say, you know, I'm having an affair with three different women right now. And, uh, you know, I, I don't love them, uh, but we have a good time together. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep those affairs going, but will you marry us? And I will say, no. He was a heterosexual. I said, no, I'm not going to do that because you're in sin. That goes against my... Can you see what I'm saying? Can you see that? It's not just the homosexual lifestyle. It's also the sin of fornication. All right? There, there's a, there may be a number of reasons why I would tell a person, no, I will not marry you. I may tell a gay couple, pray, you know, and if you get it together, come to me, I will. I say, Jesse, if you stop having those affairs, then I'll marry you. You see what I'm saying? If you stop the fornication, all right? It, but, but here he's talking about uh, the homosexual. And so it sounds like God's getting the gay people, right? Get them, God! That's what we want to do. We want to go to that gay pride parade. And we, man, I want to tell you something. We want to hammer them over the head. We want to take the word of God and we want to tell them, you're sinners and you're going to hell. Is that what God's doing here? Now listen to what he says. Likewise, verse 27, unto the men, leaving the natural use of the woman. Okay, I got that. Uh, verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, so it's saying, you, you got the word preached to you. You got the, the Holy Scriptures. You know, you got the knowledge, but you don't want to retain it. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Listen, let me tell you something. God will pull away from you. You can tell me all you want to. You can wait until the sermon's over and say, you know, Pastor, I'm telling you, I just don't think that God is going to abandon a person. God will abandon an, a person. God knows what's going on. God will abandon a person. Uh, 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 it says right there, he gave them over to a reprobate mind. Now listen, who is this? This is a person, like I said, that knows the truth. They've heard the truth. They've believed the truth. And they just chose not to do it. All right, got to speed it up here. Being, verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness. You think God's just getting the gay people? Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, uh, lasciviousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. He covered a, a lot of things here. Well, oh, wait a minute. I thought this was just going to be to get on the gay people. No. I mean, that's part of it, but that's not all of it. You know, I always say this. I, you know, we're always ready to go and we're always ready to get violent and protest abortions and we're ready to violent, get violent and protest homosexuals and everything. And, and uh, God showed me this the other day. Uh, I'm thinking about getting a bunch of signs up that says all liars shall have their place in the sea of fire and we're going to go to downtown Houston and we're going to march and we're going to say, if you're a liar, you're going to hell and you're going to burn in hell. And people are going to go, a liar? But listen, that's the same thing as homosexual or abortions. God doesn't see any level of sin. God says sin is sin. Sin is sin. All right, now look at 31. Without understanding, uh, 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. You know what he's saying? And he's fixing to say it again. You see it going on here, and you're not even stopping it. Therefore, chapter 2, now listen, I, I'm going to get into chapter 2 a little bit. You know that in the original uh, uh, context, there is, Paul didn't go chapter 2. It's all run together. It's a letter, all right? We put, man put chapter 2 and, and verse so-and-so in there so that we could reference it easy. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O, o uh, man, whosoever thou art that judgest, here we go about judging people, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemns yourself, for thou that judgest does the same things. And so we are not supposed to judge people, right? How many of you know we're not supposed to judge people? Yes, we are supposed to judge people. I'm going to explain it to you. Now you're getting me confused. Verse 3. <laughs> 
And thinkest thou, this old man, that judgest them which do things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Wow. You know what it's saying? The Bible says, how can you get the splinter out of your brother's eyes when you've got a big old two before in yours? How can you judge somebody when you're doing the same thing? What about if I have a hidden sin and if I'm uh, 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 li uh, living, sleeping around with three or four women and then I tell Jesse, I'm not going to marry you because what you're doing is a sin and it's a sin unto death and I'm getting on to him and I'm judging him. I'm doing the same thing. Then you can't judge. Okay, now turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to talk about judging here real quick. Uh, we're, we're, we're almost there. I, I don't think I'm going to be real late. Listen, you think being a pastor is easy? Listen, I'm going to tell you something. Being a pastor is hard. It's hard. Sometimes it's heartbreaking. Sometimes the things that you have to do in order to be biblical. And, and uh, you know, a lot of pastors uh, will avoid the hard things, uh, you know, uh, because it's all about the numbers. But listen. I'm fixing to read something to you, and I want you to tell me how you would feel if me as a pastor, if I approached you this way. Now, the church at Corinth had a problem, okay? There was a young man, the Bible doesn't say who he is, and he was sleeping with his stepmother, his dad's wife. And so Paul was like, you know, uh, well, let me just get a couple of the leaders together and let me, you know, we got to pray for this brother and I'm going to get him in here and tell him that he's got to get it together. That, listen, let me tell you what Paul did. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. And he's talking to them. He's getting everybody together. Hey, the whole church, gather around. i got to tell you something. It's been reported commonly here that there's fornication among you and such fornication as it is so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. He's saying, listen, somebody in this group is sinning. And you know how bad the sin is? It's worse than any of the Gentiles could ever sin. Whoever it is in here, you're sleeping with your stepmother. Wow. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. <clears throat> you know what he's saying? And everybody in the church knows about it. And you're okay with it. Wow. Wow. Now what if somebody in here was having an affair and I, I just got the church together and just said, hey, somebody in here is sleeping around, man. You know, and all, half of you in here know about it. I mean, wow. Whew, I, now, Okay, verse 3, for I verily, uh, for I verily uh, uh, as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already. There are people and there are circumstances that we are to judge. Okay, now I'm fixing to explain it to you real quick here. As though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. In the, same, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, comma, to deliver such as one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. You know what he's saying? Get that person, bring them to me, and I'm going to tell them, get out of the church. Get out of the church, and don't come back until you get it together. Can you imagine? Listen, if I told anybody in this church, you know, where's so-and-so? Well, sit down. Just me and you, one-on-one, -on -one, and I know it's affecting you. I ask that person to leave the church. Oh, my God, you'd be ready to fire me as a pastor. You can't fire me. I'm not on salary. But, you, you know, you say, well, why would you do it? It's scriptural to do that. But who would that person be? This is a pretty bad person, okay? Listen, I'm reminded of Eli. You, you, in the book of Samuel, you, you guys remember Eli? Eli was the uh, high priest, uh, okay, in the book of Samuel. And uh, his, uh, his boys, his, his grown men, would go to the temple and they were sleeping with the women that go to the temple. That go to, it was church. He was sleeping with the women in the church, all of his sons. And you know what God said? You better get it together. You better judge your sons. And you better take some action. And he didn't. And he paid for it. His sons died in battle, and then he heard about it and fell off of a fence and broke his neck. And God told him, because you didn't take care of it, I'm going to take care of it. And he told him, judge your sons. See what they're doing. You better take care of it. As a pastor, 
And, and, you know, Bonnie and I, for the past couple of weeks, have been talking about this because it's, it's a struggle. There's nothing going on. But listen, I was telling her, do you know we have to do that? In the end times, we better be ready. We talked about this a little bit Thursday. In the end times, there are going to be people that are going to come in and they're going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. And they're going to look good. And, and who are they? They may be people that have been in the church for years and years and years. And, it may, and, and God may have given them over to a reprobate mind. All right? And so when he gives them over to a reprobate mind, which means that a, a, a a evil mind. Are they going to get out of the church? Maybe not. They may stay in the church. Satan may say, you got the Bible knowledge and everything. I'm just going to use you in here to just tear this church apart. You got the wisdom in your head. You ain't got it in your heart. And you see what I'm saying? And so we, there's times when we may, listen, and, 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 and like Jesse said, certainly we leave the 99 and we go after the one. All right? We do that. We do that. But sometimes you're going to find that you're going to leave the 99 and it's going to be that one that has been in the church for 30, 40 years, that knows all that. And when you go to get them, it's going to get real ugly. Maybe God has already given them over to a reprobate mind. See what I'm saying? And so, and so you're going to have to, how do I know? Well, if you, if, you, if you spend time with God, he's going to give you that, all right? He's going to give you the, 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 the wisdom. Uh, okay, uh, verse 7, purge out, therefore, the old laban. Get the person out of there that you may be a new lump that you're, uh, 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 as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, sacrificed for us. Verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so get that person out. Verse 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle or a letter not to have company with fornicators. What is that saying? Put them out of your church. We don't do this anymore, and I don't know why. And we're talking about hard-nosed people, and I'm going to show you the hard-nosed people. But it would be, hey, man, what's going on? Sorry, dude, you know what? I don't want anything to do with you. You know, I'm going to pray for you, but just stay, don't call me anymore. Stay away from me. Why? Because you're bad news. Because you know about God. You know about God, and you refuse to do it. Stay away from me. Look at verse 10. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for they, must, uh, for they must you needs go out of the world or uh, away from society, get them out. Verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If a man that is called a brother be a fornicator or uh, covets or an idolater or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, do not eat. Verse 12, for what have I to do uh, with judge? Now, I want you to get this one scripture. I know I'm reading it out of the King James. Verse 12, for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not judge them that are we in. That is a question mark. But them that are Without, God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. You are not to judge a person that is not a Christian. That's what that is saying. God will judge that person. You are to judge your brothers and sisters in Christ. You do it out of love. You do it out of a spirit of restoration. And we had a meeting not long ago, and, and I said, you know, people come up to me and say, uh, hey, pastor, that guy's been saved for a long time, or that pastor's a leader, or wh whatever. Why is he doing that? And you know what I told you? Go ask him. You go ask him. Don't ask me. Go ask him. Hey, brother, you're, you, you know, you've been saved for 25 years, and you're doing this. Why are you doing that? That's judging. And it's doing it out of, out of love. Explain to me why you're doing that. We are supposed to do that, but not with un ungodly people. Okay, uh, we got Eli's son. I got some, uh, 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 give me 10 more minutes and I think I can finish it up. Uh, the prostitute in John 8 with that they brought to Jesus, uh, she wasn't a believer. How did he handle her? Did he judge her? Well, actually he did. He acknowledged that she was a prostitute. He just didn't condemn her, okay? And he told her, go, sin no more. Right there, he said, you're a sinner. Go and sin no more. He just didn't call her all kinds of nasty, evil things that we would call, you know, nowadays. I'm sure the guys that were chasing her were calling her some filthy names. But Jesus didn't back down. The Samaritan woman at the well, what did he tell her? He said, hey, go and get your husband. 
She said, I'm not married. He said, that's right. You've had five husbands. The one you're living with right now is not your husband. You know what he did? He held her stand up to her. He held her stand. That is a form of judging. Hey, you're, you're, you're standing here. He didn't beat her up with it and, and like we would normally do, you know. But he said, hey, I know. Here's your sin right here. It, you know, you need to get it together, all right? And then Matthew 7, 6 says, now, now, now get this, get this, all right? Don't give the holy things to the dogs or cast your pearls among wine lest they turn on you. Listen to me. There are people that I may take, uh, 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 and, and, and I haven't done this, but I want you to understand. My whole point to this really is, and we talked about it Thursday night, uh, you know, there's going to come a falling away. We know that. And there's some things that you're going to have to, to trust our leadership on that we listen to God. But listen, uh, I, I may be counseling with somebody and pouring my heart out to that person and just investing, and God may say, stop. Stop. I'm like, what? Just stop. You're casting your pearls among wine. That person's not listening to you. They have hardened their heart. I have given them every opportunity. You back up. I'm going to try to deal with them. And if I can't deal with them, it's, it's going to be their destruction. You see what I'm saying? And you say, that's kind of harsh. It'll happen. As you guys grow, you're going to see that. You're, you're, going, to, you're going to see, you're going to be talking to somebody and you're going to be pouring your heart out and all of a sudden you're just going to see their face of stone and you're just going to say, you just don't care, do you? And they're going to say no. And that's going to happen to you. I hope it doesn't, but then you're going to see how hard it is to be a pastor. Now, we're almost finished. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 6. Just a couple of books over to the right. And then I, after this, I'm going to close with one. So, like, I'm right on time here. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. And I don't know why we don't preach on this more. Because it's a hard message not for us to preach. It's a hard message for you to hear. And so we don't want to put you, well, we don't want to make you uncomfortable, you know. Why did you preach on that? You know it's going to make them uncomfortable. Good. You know, I, 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 you talk to a person and say, you know, that guy says, well, you know, in the evenings when I get home, I got to have a, have a drink, you know. That, that I got to have a shot of whiskey. That takes the edge off. Listen, maybe God doesn't want you to take that edge off. God wants you to be on that edge, all right. And it says, for it is, what's the next word? Impossible. Say it again. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to open shame." For it is impossible to renew a person like that. You say, wait a minute. How can it be impossible? How can a person sin and there's absolutely no hope for them? The blood will not cover them. That is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. There is no, that, that is the unforgivable sin. You guys have read that. Is the, and that is when you, you have a person that's been in the church that I've been talking about and the Holy Spirit, when that person starts drifting away, you know, and the Holy Spirit says, come back, come back. God loves you. And now listen, what is, what is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? And that person says, I don't care about you. I don't care about God. I know. Now listen, you, you may have a person that their mom dies and they stand up there and they say, God, I hate you. Listen, that is an emotion. That is sorrow. And God says, you know, your kids probably tell you if you spank them, I hate you. They don't hate you. That, that, that's their emotion speak. Listen, God knows that. That's not what I'm talking about. God can say, you know, it's okay. It's okay. You know, take a little time. I'm, I'm going to help you along. But for, for a person that's not speaking out of anger, not speaking out of emotion, that, and they just say, you know, I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't want any part of this. I don't want to go to church. All I want to do is just party and party and party. And I know you're draw, trying to draw me. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I just don't want it. I turn my back on it. There is no hope for that person. That person is going to hell. That person cannot come back later and say, uh, you know, I kind of messed up and I, I want to repent for that. You cannot do it. You'll probably never meet a person like this, okay? 
but it is a person that not out of anger or anything. It's just like, like I talked about Thursday when I say, you know, no more games. You've got to live a holy life, and here's what God expects of you. And you come up and you just say, I, I'm just not going to do that. I, I like partying too much. And the Holy Spirit steps in, all right? Now, this is where the danger comes from. The Holy Spirit steps in and says, you know that's wrong. And you get the conviction. You get the pull. And you say, I don't care. I don't care. I don't want that anymore. There is no hope for that person. There's no hope for that. I know people are going to come up and talk to me afterwards. I'm going to read it again real fast. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them, it's impossible, again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and they put him to open shame. Now, if you want a spiritual reference to that, Matthew 12, 31. Uh, you stay where you're at, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to turn over there real quick and read it to you. Uh, and then after that, I've got a closing scripture. Wherefore I say unto you, this is Jesus, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it'll be forgiven. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. You can hit your thumb and say, GD, and you can be forgiven for that. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit drawing you, and you say, don't draw me anymore. I don't want to serve God. I understand. I know. I'm not angry. I just don't want to do it. I prefer this. And you're actually saying, I prefer death, a spiritual death. That's what I prefer. There are people that will do that. It's hard to believe. The Bible says it. Okay, everybody turn to John 3, 17, and this is my, I'm, I'm, I'm closing on this. Everybody knows John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But look at verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world, now th this world here, to condemn the world, but, set the, but that the world through him might be saved. Now read on. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not on him is condemned already. And we should condemn those people. Because he hath not believed in the name of the holy begotten Son of God. <clears throat> I'm sorry. God will condemn those people. These, uh, this is talking about people that have not accepted Jesus. I apologize for that. Verse 19, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. This is one reason why people don't want to serve God. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Verse 21, But he that doeth the truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be man, uh, made manifest and that they are wrought in God. Listen, we are to judge each other, but we are to do it out of love, out of a spirit of love, out of a spirit of restoration. The Bible says that anyone that turns a man uh, against his sins does a good thing. You save his soul, and we're supposed to do that. But listen, we're not supposed to judge those people that are going to the abortion clinic. We're not supposed to judge those people uh, in the gay, gay pride parade. We're supposed to stand up for God and we're supposed to present the truth to Him but not judge them. But listen, let me tell you something. Uh, when, 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 you know, if Jesse messes up, Jesse's getting more and more of the Word, more and more of the Word. I don't know why I'm keying in on Jesse. Uh, more and more of the Word. And, and God, I know what level he's on and there are certain things where I may say, hey man, you got a minute? And we go in there and I say... You, you know better than this. And I've already preached on this three times. And I watch you. You listen to me. You know better than this. Yeah, I know. Okay, you need to get it together, all right? Now, there may be something that he is not mature enough to know. And God's going to say, just hang on. I'll, I'll work in that. I'll work in that, all right? But here's the thing that we have to worry about as leaders. Things that will affect the rest of the sheep. I've sat down and sometimes Body and I uh, have even had heated words over this in, in the past where, where I, I, you know, and I tell her, listen, if this person starts tearing the sheep apart, I'm going to go to that person, I'm going to say, get out of my church and don't come back to my church. And it's like, <gasps> how can you say that? Because I have to protect you. It would be like if a rattlesnake came in here and I would say, 
You know, and that rattlesnake's going in between you. No, leave him alone. That's God's creature. Let him go. He's going among y'all. I'll stomp on him. Man, I got to protect. I'd jump on it and grab it. I said, I got to protect this flock here. I can't let this snake go in through here. Well, we can't let wolves go in among you guys either. Okay? And so there's times you're just, you're going to have to trust us. All right? Father,